Thank you for your uh, encouragement of us. Someone asked me, they said, how old were you when you came here? Well, um, you won't remember this, you have no reason to remember this, but, but Karen, uh, September the 11th, 2005, was our first Sunday as your pastor. Karen's birthday was on that day. She had turned 53, and I would turn 53 a few days later. And you know this by now if you've hung around here any time at all. Every year in September, between the 11th and the 14th, I get to have fun being married to an older woman and, uh, and try to make the most of that. And I told uh, Joanne and Clifton we got to swing through and see them, check on him for his surgery and be with Karen's family for her aunt's funeral this past week. And I told him, I said, I'm just looking forward to seeing what it's like to hang out with a, an older woman again. I do that every year. It's good to be with you, though, today. I'm feeling much better. You know that. Uh, the Lord knows what's ahead for us, but, uh, but I'm feeling great. And I thank God for that. I thank God for your prayers. We're looking forward to however long the Lord gives us together. We're in his hands. We serve at his pleasure. Uh, coming out of seminary, so a, a Southern Baptist seminary, Southwestern's where I went, the average tenure for a pastor coming out of sem seminary was, was 16 months. Uh, my friend Errol Hulse, who's with the Lord now, from England, joked one time, they, then the seminary should supply you with poster mobiles where you can simply pull up and plug into the parking lot and never bother to unpack since you're not going to be there long. I thank God he's let me be here a long time. We thank the Lord for you, for the privilege of serving you. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. Brother Norman has tweaked our purpose statement, and I like it. Uh, you'll hear him talking about loving God supremely. I like that adverb there. How should we love God? Supremely. And, and loving uh, others, one, one another and others, loving and serving one another and others sacrificially. Two excellent descriptives. The reason I call attention to that is our text that we looked at last week speaks to us about loving not only in word but in, in deed and according to truth. Which reminds us that if we're going to live for God, if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, then we don't get to set the definitions. God has graciously done that for us. We're going to see that uh, more, more intensely today at the second part of this passage as we think about loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24. I told you my intention is to, to go through the dozen or so expressions of the command to love one another before we branch out in just what that looks like. Serving one another, bearing with one another, encouraging one another, endeavoring with one another, rebuking one another. Before we launch into that, we're looking, we're kind of laying this foundation here. And we began that uh, last week uh, on this particular, this is the fourth or fifth installment now. Loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read 1 John 3, 11 to 24. And we'll pick up where we left off last week. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, 
that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And of course, that doesn't mean we should never say I love you. It means in word or talk only, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. What have we read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And as this word continues to capture, as Paul says in Corinthians, every thought, take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. As this word continues to wash over our hearts and shape us and, and influence the beat of our hearts, may it be manifested in a supreme love for God, God above all else and all others, and a sacrificial servant love for one another and for the world. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week that if you read 1 John through carefully, you know that he divides, for him the world's divided into two classes of people, the children of God and the children of the devil. There's no middle ground, no in between for him. There's only light and darkness, not a twilight. He only sees life or death. He uses present tense verbs, doing, does, uh, renders, continues to do, loves, continues to love. In the first part of his letter, he emphasizes righteousness. This is a transition portion here where he begins to emphasize love. In other words, righteousness is a life of love. Having been justified by faith alone and Christ alone, by the grace of God alone, we love. We cannot help but love. Even when you don't want to love, you find yourself compelled to love. And I said to you last week that love can be thought of as the highest expression of righteousness. Not a maudlin sentimentality. We talked about that before. No, a, a biblical love. A biblically based, a biblically sourced, a biblically energized love. And so he's told you that this, this section here breaks down along the, these following expressions. Love for one another is the highest expression of the gospel. Verses 11, 12, we looked at that. Love for one another is evidence of the new birth. Verses 13 to 15, we looked at that. Love for one another is supremely demonstrated in the death of Jesus Christ. Verses 16 to 18, and now today. Love for one another is evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. You see, if you love him, you've been enabled to love him by a work of the Spirit in the new birth. You began watching last Sunday night. I hope you're participating in this. I'm looking forward to being a part of it tonight. Karen and I actually got to listen to several episodes of this study as we were traveling uh, from, from Oklahoma to Texas to Louisiana to Texas and back here. And it's a great study. And you'll recall, I think, I forget which section it's in, when Martin Luther was asked at one point 
in his journey, struggling, struggling to, to please God, struggling to have the favor of God, struggling to enter into the righteous standard of God. So you, do you love God? He said, love God, I hate God. Wow, how could you say that? Because he saw no way to please God. He saw God's standard of inflexible righteousness as unattainable, and no matter how hard he tried, the more of a deficit he felt. Until you discover, as he discovered, reading Augustine's commentary on Romans, that the righteousness of God is God's righteousness which he imputes to sinners by faith in Jesus Christ. When that happens to you and to me, there is birthed into our hearts not only the enabling to repent of sin, to be sorry for sin and to hate it and forsake it because we know it displeases God, not only the enabling of faith in Christ where we come to rest only in the perfect life of Jesus Christ, in his life, his, his active righteousness, his active obedience where he perfectly kept the law of God the moment of every day of his life on this earth. His passive righteousness or passive obedience where he willingly surrendered himself. He laid down his life and died in our place. He rose from the grave. And we, like children, look to Jesus and live by faith. And in that enabling of repentance, that enabling of faith in Christ, that experience we call the new birth, there is birth in us, Peter says, we've been made partakers of the divine nature. And when you become a partaker of the divine nature, not, not like these silly people who run around saying, we're gods too, I'm a god. It's nonsense. Whether it comes out of the mouth of a Mormon or out of the mouth of a charismatic, it's nonsense. No partakers of the divine nature, and that now you're enabled to love like God loves. You're compelled to love as the very nature of God loves his own. And this text shows us this, so that in the fourth place, love for one another is evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. I'll read verses 19 to 24 again just to get them in our minds. By this, shall we know by this we shall know that we are of the truth there's that say that sourcing that you only understand followers of Christ as you understand them being sourced in the truth birthed in the truth by this we are we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him he's talking about about a biblical basis for assurance there's false assurance a lot of people have false assurance coming to them all the, they're sitting at home today multitudes of them no interest in the things of God, no interest in being with the people of God, yet they think they're going to spend eternity in heaven rejoicing with the people of God when they can't stand to be with them one or two Sundays a month. Absurd. No, there's a biblical assurance. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. I'm talking about assurance here. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Whose commandments? Whose commandments are we talking about here? Trace your antecedent. God. What are God's commandments? The Ten Commandments. The whole law of God is summarized in the Ten Commandments. I have friends who want to play the law of Christ against the law of God. That is not, that's not biblical. First John's one of the last letters written in the entire Bible. His commandments. Because we keep His commandments. And do, there's that little word, practice what pleases Him. And this is His commandment. I want, we're going to come back to this, but I want you to see some. He uses the singular commandment, but He speaks of a double issue. This is His commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another 
just as he has commanded us. Whoever is keeping his commandments is abiding in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. My Greek professor, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, observed in his commentary that these verses 19 and 20 are generally conceded to be the most difficult verses in the entire letter of 1 John. And it's primarily because of grammar complexity. What's he, what's he saying? Who's he saying it about? What's he referencing here? We won't delve into the grammar. We'll just try to, try to do an exposition of what I believe is the best rendering of this. In fact, Dr. Vaughn suggests you should consult several translations to see the numerous ways in which the text is rendered. And we see here, as we unfold in verse 19, the possibility of assurance. If you go over to the end of 1 John, we won't do that right now. He says in chapter 5, verse 13, I've written these things to you, which means everything from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 5, verse 12. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may, that you may uh, know that you have life. In other words, 1 John is written with tests and challenges. You love God, you ought to love the brothers. You don't love the brothers, you don't love God. I mean, these challenges are all through it. You don't believe Jesus is the Christ, you're not of God. You don't, you don't believe the word, you're not of God. He's just very black and white here. And because he wants his readers and all who would read after them to know that there is the possibility of biblical assurance. I know people, you may know some people, you may be one of them who have struggled with assurance of salvation all of the days since you confessed faith in Christ. Or maybe, maybe you began the journey with what would be a, a real a peace and assurance, and you've, you've lost that along the way, and you struggle. John says, I want you to know you can have biblical assurance. By this we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Assuring our consciences, our heart to God. One commentator said, we know we belong to the truth. Another said, we take our character on the truth. One said, we are on the side of the truth. In other words, if you, if you follow John's thinking, you're either a child of the devil or you're a child of God. No middle ground. Not, you don't have one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom, though. No. John says, here's how we know. We can know. And we can reassure our hearts before God. Stand before God. The heart in the Bible, by the way, often stands for the whole inner man. It's, it's the emotion, it's the intellect, it's the will, it's the whole person. One commentary says we set our hearts at rest. You might want to use the word conscience. That that awareness as creatures made in the image of God, that rational capacity that we have that animals don't have. We have a conscience. You know some people whose consciences have been seared. That's what the, script, the scripture describes. In other words, they're, they're past feeling. But most people have a tender conscience. And it can be wounded. And it can be grieved. And troubled. But we do live in a generation where it seems like the hard heart, the seared conscience, is on the ascendancy. I don't know if you read recently 
uh, our governor, who professes to be a believer, people who know him personally, pastors who know him personally, ensure, say that that is true about him, intends to speak at a men's conference this next uh, weekend at a church in the Tulsa area. And he's being railed against by the Freedom From Religion Society, who say it's a violation of the separation of church and state, one of the most bogus things ever posited upon the American conscience. There is no separation of church and state in our Constitution. There was a pastor from Danbury, Connecticut, Baptist pastor who wrote to Thomas Jefferson and, and be sure that you don't breach the wall of separation. And he was not saying, be sure that religion doesn't enter into government. He was saying, be sure that government doesn't infringe on religion. That's the history behind it. It's one of the most wicked things that's ever been done in our society is this imposing of separation of church and state. So of course this group out there, this with seared consciences, are railing against our government. And he's using tax dollars, which he won't be, to speak to Christian men about being Christian men. It's nonsense. Christian men need to be called up. Our consciences need to be challenged. And John says that can happen in the presence of God. In fact, the way he says it here, it, the text actually renders in God's presence these things will happen. So that's the emphasis, is, is do you want biblical assurance? Do you want to live your life in such a way that when you come to the end of your life and you stand in the presence of God, you will have full-orbed biblical assurance? And he goes on having expressed that it's possible to have assurance, to speak of the importance of this assurance. Look at verse 20. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. It's interesting that some of the renderings of this, this is part of the complexity of the grammar. Some people read this as if he's saying, when your heart condemns you, don't worry. God knows more than you do, so just relax. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, if your conscience condemns you, God knows you better than you do. You should tremble when your conscience condemns you. You should repent. Because, see, you can fool the people and even fool yourself. But you can't fool God. God knows everything. He is omniscient. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. It's only what we're thinking what we're inclined to do. And so he sets this before us. There's the possibility of assurance, and it's very important that you come to assurance, and you need to come this way. Not kidding yourself. Folks, do you, do you understand that there are multitudes living right now going along their way living their life, their way, their time, their calendar, who imagine when they die, they will go to heaven. And it's not true. So, Pastor, that's harsh. Who are you? I, that's not me. That's Jesus. Many will say to me in that day, Matthew said, in your name, we talked. In your name, we cast out demons. In your name, we did miracles. And Jesus says, and I will say, depart from me. You who acted as if there was no law. Depart from me. The word there is anomia. As if there's no law. As if you could live your own way. Do your own thing. Multitudes will perish. With a membership card on file. With a baptism certificate. With an experience. So biblical assurance is critical. 
And he's going he's to get to how that happens. Because in the last three verses, or four, he talks about the fruit of assurance. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In other words, if you're, if you're, if you're anchored in the truth, driven by the scriptures, by the word, shaped by the word, in love with the Lord, the impulse, the direction is love. So if, that's, if your heart doesn't condemn you, then, then that's a basis for confidence before God. Watch what he does here. There is internal assurance, but there's external basis. Whatever we ask, we receive from him. Don't stop there. Because we keep his commandments. The word keep. We practice obedience to his commandments and practice what pleases him. Those are not two different things. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And he tells us in the first table of the law that we're to have no other gods before him, so nothing should have our allegiance more than he does. We're not to make unto ourselves any graven image. We're not to imagine God and reduce God to our imagination of him, whether it's just an just a image in our minds or it's actually something physical. Any likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth, we shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For the Lord our God is a jealous God. And he will visit such iniquities upon the fathers to be passed on to their children and their grandchildren. He will judge that. But he will show mercy to thousands. This is the beautiful thing about the gospel. When the gospel comes into a family, the likelihood of the gospel trickling down as it's shared and believed is under thousands of generations of those who love him and keep his commandments, you see. We're not to take his name in vain. If the, if the word G-O-D comes out of your mouth, wash your mouth out with soap and spit out unless you're speaking it in prayer or sharing him with others, but never as an exclamation of frustration that's taking his name in vain. And certainly attaching it as a prefix to a curse word taking his name in vain. But so is using it loosely. Well, God, God told me that I'm taking his name in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. In other words, six days you need to get all your work done. Don't treat the Lord's day, the Sabbath, as the week's wastebasket. Yes, some people have to work on Sundays. That's a work of necessity. But to excuse being apart from the people of God when we gather on the Lord's day in the name of having to get your stuff done, you're treating the Lord's Day like the week's wastebasket. Saturday part two is what it is for many people. You see, that's how you please God. It's not complicated. It's just intense. But see, you also please God by the way you relate to others. You're to honor your father and your mother. Children, you're to honor your father and your mother. Grown children, you're to honor your father and your mother. Grandchildren, we can go on and on. You get the point? God is a God of order. And he gives order to his society. And that carries with it the responsibility of parents being honorable. You know the number one factor, the number one common denominator in all the mass shootings is no meaningful father figure in the home. You think God will not be mocked? We have unleashed on our culture bloodthirsty young men and women, primarily young men, who live without a dad. And they're mad. And they're angry. And they're killers. Honor your father and your mother. That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You know the rest of them. Don't murder. We've already seen in this text. Cain was a murderer. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I say don't hate. 
And John's process is, if you don't love God, you hate God. And if you hate God, you can't love others. And if you don't love others, you're a murderer. I mean, that's, that's the way John factors through this. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. Number seven, don't commit adultery. Honor marriage. This culture is off the rails. If you dare to speak of being monogamous, faithful to your, to your wife, say things like, I don't allow myself to be alone with another woman. Oh my God, oh my goodness gracious. What, is, what have we got in the White House for crying out loud? This vice president of ours, he's, he's so misogynistic. He hates women so Folks, we've gone crazy. The culture has gone stark, raving, mad. Marriage, one man, one woman, and a one-flesh relationship for all of life. That's bigoted today. Two genders are 32. You see how important it is? If you want biblical assurance in this culture, don't look to people for it. Go to the Word of God, because he says here, the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. That's all our government does. That's all, that's all, and I was starting to say one party, but that's not true. That's all both parties want to do is steal, just confiscate. It's called taxation. Steal this, steal that, take this, take that. You should not steal the right to property. Don't lie, don't bear false witness. Not only tell the truth, but tell it in a timely way. Be honest. Then don't covet. I've told you before, this is fascinating with the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to stop here. All the rest of these things we've read through, you, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing, you're, you're saying, you're, you're killing, you're, you're loving, you're, you're working. You're, you can stand perfectly still, not move a muscle, and covet. So it comes full circle. Paul says in Colossians, covetousness is idolatry. You come back to no other gods before me. You see, that's how you please God. And if you're pleasing God, then your prayers are aligned with him. That's the beauty here. In other words, you don't, you don't do this and then God becomes your big ATM machine. No. When, you're, when this is the life that you're striving to live, you're more in tune with the will of God. And you pray more in tune with him. Look at verse 23. And this is his commandment, singular that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, one of the great themes of 1 John. In other words, we, we are true followers of Christ. We have genuine, saving faith and love one another. You can't separate the two. Well, I'm about me, my, and my. I'll never forget when, when Y2K was coming. I don't know what y'all were doing here for Y2K, but in, in Shreveport, we had some people that were real uh, survivalist types. I'll never forget a guy in our church. Had a, he wanted to have a meeting. We have a meeting. We have a meeting. We got to talk about this with our congregation. Well, so we had a meeting, you know. And uh, I was being assured by computer types that it's not going to be a big deal. But he, so we had a meeting and we get to talking. He'd been, they'd been storing up stuff for months and months and months. Uh, they had bought more guns and ammunition and more food. And, and then he said this. He said, "If you're not making preparation for this, don't come showing up at my door when it happens." I thought, well, there, well, the gospel just went up in flames there. And what do you think this is? Is this like the little red hen talking about fixing a meal for crying out loud? You see? No, love. Love. Sometimes you just can't help it. Karen and I were in a Walmart uh, in Shreveport in, uh, the other day. This woman's walking across the, the parking lot, and you, you know, you just sometimes can tell. I mean, and our eyes met, and she just begins to weep uncontrollably. Now, I will allow that it was possibly crocodile tears, but I was moved by that. Thought. So I was getting in my car, and I stopped, and I said, are you okay? What's, what's going on? And she just broke down weeping. This woman never met me. Huh? Running from a man. Uh, she was from Texas that was trying to get to her, to harm her. And she 
just trying to get some gas money to get to her dad's house. You know, maybe I got took. But something inside me said, you need to help this person. So I reached out to her, shared the gospel with her, and she said, oh, she said, she said, I, I'm a Christian. I, I believe in Jesus. I can't believe God sent me a, another Christian. So would you pray for me? So we prayed out there in the parking lot. It's just, you, know, you do some things sometimes that, that you didn't plan to do. Love compels it. Love compels it. We love one another just as he has commanded us. So you can't separate the two, folks. You cannot separate faith in Christ and love for one another. There are people trying to do it. A multitudes. Multitudes. Who imagine they're on their way to heaven and they don't give one, one iota of a sense of concern or care for the, for the brethren. Let me tell you something. One of the marks of loving the brethren is being where the brethren are when they meet. Just If you had a child stayed up in his room, time to eat. Where's Bobby? He's in his room. Oh, why ain't he? He doesn't say he doesn't want to eat with us. Hmm. What's going on there? He doesn't like us. What? The brothers are gathering? Brothers and sisters are getting... Great. It's a psalmist attitude. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It would read a little differently if the psalmist said, you know, oh, yeah, they said it's time to go again. Don't we go enough? That's, no, you don't. You say, that's totally contrary to the spirit of the psalmist. Exactly, that's my point. You recognize that. If we love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever is keeping his commandments is abiding in God. And God is abiding in him. And this is where John's been going. It's not a saying faith. It's a saving faith. It's not talking love. It's doing love. It's acting. That's why I decided to change the, the theme of the study. One anothering, a participle, action. One anothering. Whoever keeps his commandments is abiding in God. God's abiding in him. And by this we know that he is abiding in us. By the Spirit whom he has given us. Final point. When the Spirit indwells you, you and I may, for a season, move against the flow of the gospel. But you can't keep it up. Because John teaches us, Paul teaches us, that when, that when we disobey God's clear teachings, and these are clear, it grieves the Spirit who indwells us. Because you see, He makes much of God and makes much of Jesus. And when the Spirit is grieved, He's not like a pouting child. When the Spirit is grieved, he grieves me, and he grieves you. Because see, the Lord loves us too much to let us continue in sin. Yes, we can step into sin. Yes, we can cultivate wrong thinking. But he loves us too much to let us stay there. This is how we know that he is abiding in us. It's not, that we, not because we say he does. Not because someone else has told us he does. It's by the Spirit whom he has given us who provokes us to love him and keep his commandments. And John assures us in chapter 5, his commandments are not a burden to those who have been born again. 
They are, however, to people who haven't been born again. I was talking with, with Nettie before the service. Josue's grieved because he says there's so many people there who say they love God. They, they may go to church, but they just, they're, they're so mean and cynical and negative. How can that be? It's the difference between religion and Christianity. It's the difference between saying faith and saving faith. Saving faith has the Spirit indwelling us, stirring in us, grieving us when we sin so that our conscience accuses us when we sin and we repent of that. 1 John 1, 7, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then saving faith has the working of the Spirit so that we love God, we strive to obey His commandments, to do what pleases Him, and we know that loving Him and loving others pleases Him, and so we love one another. And sometimes we do that when we don't want to. But you know what you're going to find? I promise you, mark it down. Every time you engage in loving one another, even when you're not there mentally, the Lord brings you along there. It's beautiful to see. I don't feel like it. Well, the enemy of your soul has got you right where he wants you. Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And if he can get to messing with you and convince you you're a hypocrite, if you do something in the name of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you don't feel like doing you hypocrite, then he's got you. And just the opposite is true. The scripture teaches you do what is right. Just because it's right to do. Trust the Lord to give the attending feeling. And I close with this illustration. At the wedding feast in Cana, Mary came to Jesus and said, they're out of wine. Jesus, he, we won't go into the rebuke there, he says, why would you tell me that? It's fascinating, Mary's faith. She didn't look at him and think, well, that, that didn't go the way I thought. No. She looks at the wine stewards and says, whatever he says to you, do it. That's faith, folks. So, he's the visiting rabbi. He says, fill, the, uh, fill those vessels, the vats, with water. Now, folks, if you're scrambling to save the character and reputation of the host of the wedding, taking time, because you don't, they didn't just turn the faucet on. They had to go get water, fill those things with water. Doesn't make any sense. It's time you don't have. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. They filled it with water. He said, draw some out. Says to the steward, draw some out. The steward says, wow. Everybody else that has a wedding serves the good stuff, and then the cheap stuff comes out when, when, the, when the palate is numbed somewhat by the, by the wine. You've saved the best wine for last. And you walk away from that wedding in Canaan knowing, you know something? The Lord calls upon me to do some things, to be some things. They don't come naturally for me, supernatural. Uh, they don't even, don't even come easily for me, not even, sometimes not even pleasantly for me. Yet he's called me to do it. And whatever he calls me to do, I'm going to do it by his grace, for his glory. Even if I don't feel like it, I'm going to trust him to sanctify my feelings in this as a part of the working out of obedience to him. And that's what one anothering is. See, if we wait until we feel like it, we've got an enemy of our souls who will make sure that we don't. Because life happens. Are you one anothering? Look for opportunities. They're all around you. In Jesus' name, bless somebody today. In Jesus' name, touch somebody today. In Jesus' name, love one another. At home, in your family, in your church, in your neighborhood, love one another. That's what abiding in God looks like. And it delights in what he's revealed to us about how he would have us live as followers of the crucified, risen, ascended, reigning, 
interceding and soon returning, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in Jesus' name. and We read this text, and Lord, this, very honestly, sometimes we wish some things weren't so plain. We have a little wiggle room, but we know that John doesn't leave us any wiggle room, and we're staring this square in the face, and I just pray, first of all, for my own soul, for my own, my own mind, my own heart, that, that I would be a person inclined to act, to love in truth, to love in deed, and that this, this would be infectious with me and with my brothers and sisters here, and that we would be like never before, a one anothering gospel community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we prepare to dismiss today.